Joe woke to the silence inside them each day. The house was a morning chorus quietly singing. When it was windy, the trees would sway. When it was cold, the walls would creak. The radiator gurgled, or a dog barked somewhere down the street. But the silence, the heavy seeping stain of quiet, was the thing that greeted Joe each day. It was always there, every morning, right where they had left it. When Joe walked outside, people went past their faces as blank as the grey sky. Or they crossed the road so that they didn't get too close. In the shop, Joe tried to smile, but their smile was swallowed up by the silence. Back at home, Joe tried to do some work, but the tiny click-clack-click of the computer keyboard felt silly next to all that quietness. When hoovering, Joe liked to listen to podcasts. That was how they knew so many facts about animals. For example, did you know that a whale's heart weighs about as much as a small car? Because Joe did. Of course, they had nobody to tell their facts to. They read joke books alone and laughed, or hummed to themselves in the bath. It was hard work, ignoring all that silence. At night, it lay next to Joe in bed. It tossed and turned, pressed its hand flat against Joe's head. It was cold, but burned. It stole the duvet, maneuvered round the room, clumping from door to curtain, constant, silent, certain. When Joe's mum rang, Joe didn't answer. They knew that that space between them would only fill with hush. The silence grew and grew. It grew and grew and grew and grew. It made the night go blackest black. It made our Joe go bluest blue. And now Joe didn't know what to do. They sat there, bluer than an overworked Smurf, without anyone to talk to on the whole earth. They saw their own reflection and sighed. (sighs) Just look at me. As blue as bluest blue can be. I must be bluer than the sea. But this gave Joe a great idea. Their mattress, new and from Ikea, they promptly lifted from their bed to drag it up to Berry Head. Well, it was very heavy, so they took the bus instead. Everybody on the bus began to tut and make a fuss. Their eyes were little javelins. Their whispered words were violence. Joe looked out the window, though, until all they heard was silence. And standing at the water's edge, Joe made a wet and whispered promise. They pledged themselves completely to the sea and to the silence. And with that, they climbed onto their mattress and cast off into the swell, like a wish into a bottomless well. Days passed. Weeks passed. The sea was quiet, cold and vast. Joe made a little makeshift mast out of bits of bedding. Now they were headed nowhere fast. The sea was quiet, cold and vast. Joe floated till they came at last across a kind of island. It was sandy and grey, a little barren, but it looked okay. Joe decided they would set up camp, a fortress for their thoughts, a base for their blue, a quiet place with blissful nothingness to do. They headed for the nearest bank and hauled their mattress up. Now on top, looking like a seal pup on a big rock, Joe surveyed the sea. It stretched, improbable and sloshy in every conceivable direction. Joe stood and saw that it was good. They listened and there was no sound, only big blueness blooming all around. Here they could be happy, monarch of their own quiet island, the ruler of nothing, dominion over silence. The sea would be blue only when Joe said that it was so, the sun would only go where Joe set it. They lay their regal head down, close their tired eyes, and when the silence washed over them, they let it. Joe woke because they heard a sound. 
a sound that wasn't there before. It sounded like a massive snore, the sound came rising through the ground, this really rough and rumbling sound, this very gruff and grumbling sound. Joe pressed an ear against the grey and listened. It was as though the whole island was alive and waking. Suddenly, Joe's new home began to sway and sway and sway, side to side, to and fro, slight at first, swooping like a little magpie lark until it arched into these quickening, sea-sickening arcs. Joe was flung but clung on, while all around the spray, the spray, the spray, plumes of water, huge and white, cascaded and paraded all up the sides. Joe began to pray and pray, waves were crashing, splashing down, dramatic and disastrous, until a really massive one carried off the mattress away, away, away. Another wave came and knocked Joe down. They tumbled into the treacherous sea. If a person falls from an island and there's nobody around to hear it, does that person make a sound? Well, yes. Because as Joe cascaded down the banks of their newfound home, grunting and disgruntled, deserted by their own desert island, they did something they had never done before. They opened up their gullet wide and jettisoned this loud and angry roar. Stop! They cried. And the island went dead still. Then, slowly, it began to swivel in the water. It turned its huge, lugubrious bulk until Joe was looking directly into the island's eye. Which is strange, because islands don't normally have eyes. At that moment, a huge geyser erupted from the island's surface. The sea spat and stirred. The sky was evidently shaken. Joe began to understand they might have been mistaken. They went from being blue like a smurf is to trembling and pale. This was no island. This was a whale. A cetacean. An oceanic beast. What looked like a trap door began to open in a giant swinging motion. The water rushed towards it. Joe, shaking in the sea, got a glimpse of this ginormous krill-sucking grill. They started panicking until... Hello, said the whale. Joe froze for a moment, and then remembered their manners. Hello. What's your name? asked the whale. Uh, Joe, said Joe. However did you find me? I've been so lonely ever since I lost my song. The whale revealed that long, long ago it had a song. A song that almost every whale knows. But that's the trouble, sighed the whale. I've forgotten how it goes. Ever since then, the whale had been floating on its own, speaking only to itself and the far-flung moon, trying to remember the tune. Trouble is, my brain is just so colossal, it could be anywhere, you know? But Joe was puzzled. Don't you like it, though, being on your own? When I'm with other people, Sometimes I feel, um, quiet. I never really know what to say or how to talk or if my tongue might suddenly fall out of my head. That's why I came out here, to be alone instead. Well, yes, replied the whale thoughtfully, chewing on a few tons of plankton. I sometimes feel the same, but having other whales around to swim or sing or dive together with even to touch fins with every once in a while, to shed a big salty tear or share a smile, to hear that somebody's near, even when really they're miles away, to know they're listening. I think that's really important. And when you want some time alone, well, the ocean is pretty huge. There are plenty of places to find some solitude. Take it from me, you strange tiny porpoise. What you mustn't do is conform to this idea of sociability that you think society expects of you. No, you have to do it for yourself. And don't mistake loneliness for isolation. Even in the biggest, most overcrowded shoal, you can still sometimes find yourself a lonely soul. 
The whale looked so wise and grand that Joe, though they didn't fully understand, nodded. Um, yes, I suppose. And then they shivered from the sea and their clumpy wet clothes, and so the whale extended a courteous fin and lifted Joe carefully onto him. What's your name? asked Joe. Oh, that's tricky. I've gone by so many names. Leviathan, Moby Dick, Fastito Callum. But you, my friend, can call me Alan. Well, do you want to know a fact, Alan? Oh, yes, please. Okay. Uh, Did you know that a whale's heart weighs about the same as a small car? Oh, that's amazing. What is a car? So Joe told Alan all about the land that they had come from. About cars and tractors and actors off of Hollyoaks. About chickens and coffee and sticky toffee puddings. They told Alan every fact they knew, until at last they didn't feel or look so blue. That's really amazing, said Alan. You know so many facts. I only wish my other friends were here to meet you. But without the song, I have no way to contact them. Again, the whale sighed a sigh and looked particularly glum. I'd write to them, if only I had paper and a pen and thumbs. Well, why don't you just make up a tune? Make one up? Our songs have been crafted over thousands of years and passed down from cow to calf, older than the continents, more precious than all the ambergris in the sea. I can't just go making one up. Besides, I don't know how. And with this, Alan the Whale looked his glummest glum. Well, said Joe, um, sometimes in the bath I like to hum. No particular notes or tune or song, you know, I just make it up as I go along. And so Joe hummed, a quiet little hum. And it went, hum, diddly hum, oh, diddly tum, hum, and suddenly Alan didn't look so glum, so he hummed along with the hum diddly ums. Hum diddly um, oh diddly tum, and when he hum diddly ummed, and indeed toe diddly tummed, his whole body vibrated from nose to tail. The sea twitched like a Richter scale, it ruffled birds and shook the sails, and in its underwater course it blew with gale force and grew, it grew, and grew, and grew, and grew, and grew, and And at last the other whales came. Along this newfound shipping lane, spraying and playing in the water, all in mottled grey or black or blue, all bound together like a crew. Joe didn't know what to do, but Alan did. He took the cue. This is my friend Joe, he said. They helped me find a brand new tune, and made me feel less alone. Hi Joe, said the other whales. Hi Joe, hi Joe. So Joe spent the whole afternoon hanging out with the pod. Their tongue never once fell out of their head. Nobody thought they were quiet or odd. In fact, it could even be said that Joe had a whale of a time. When the night drew in, Alan swam Joe back to the shore. Joe waved goodbye, got on the bus and went home, feeling less alone than they ever had before. They smiled to themselves and to everyone they saw. They called their mum, knowing how good it was to keep somebody close even when they're far. They hummed a quiet hum, and when they thought of Alan and all their new friends, their heart swelled up to the size of a car.